This is It Was a Thing on TV. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the dregs of humanity. Episode 303, submission number 338, Star Trek, the animated series. Star Trek, the animated series, aired on the NBC television network from September 8th, 1973 to October 12th, 1974 for 22 episodes. On September 8th, 1966, a Gene Roddenberry production named Star Trek premiered on NBC in prime time. Little did anybody know at that point what a groundbreaking franchise that would become in subsequent decades. 55 years, at least 8 series, 3 of them animated, and 13 movies later, it persists to this day. But how did we get this show? Yeah, how did we get this show? Well, obviously it had to have been because Star Trek was such a hit in syndication. Because the series got canceled in 69, and then Paramount basically said, okay, local stations, here's all 79 episodes of Star Trek. You can air them as much as you want. And really, Star Trek became such a success in syndication because it aired after when kids were done with school. Yeah, I remember uh, when I was growing up in California, it would air on uh, Channel 2, KTVU. Shout out to KTVU. Uh, Five o'clock every afternoon. And yeah, it was such a success in the 70s. And of course, it later led to those classic Mego toys. And of course, the um, as popularized on the toys that made us that Siren that wouldn't stop going off, like, woo, 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 woo. Paramount, the owners of the franchise, basically wanted to, I don't know if you would call it closure, but they wanted to see if they could make some more money off of it. In fact, Gene Roddenberry went on record as saying, this show is greenlit because I needed the money. Yeah, I mean, Planet Earth and Genesis 2 weren't going to get sold this series. So it's like, okay, might as well make some money. Might as well. So he dusted off the franchise and uh, called up Norm Prescott and Lou Scheimer of Filmation to team up to create Star Trek the Animated Series. Or I guess it would just be called Star Trek back then. Sometime between then and now, it was also called the Animated Adventures of Gene Roddenberry's Star Trek. It went by a number of names. The whole point of this show was to continue and perhaps maybe finish the five-year voyage of the USS Enterprise, retaining the look and the feel of the original series, but adding elements that would not be otherwise possible in live action. Since now, we all know, cartoons can do anything. Yeah, back in 1973, it was like cartoons. Eh, let's just do this as cheap as possible. Well, it's filmation. That was pretty much Yeah, it. that was their motto, yes. Let's just get something done as cheap as possible. So Gene Roddenberry basically uh, called up some of his friends who wrote for the original series. They wrote the episodes for the original series and basically tasked them to come up with new treatments involving the original cast and perhaps some new characters because there are some new faces on board the USS Enterprise. We'll get into that later. And heading up the writer's room would be a legendary Star Trek slash science fiction slash television scribe DC Fontana one of the unsung heroines of all of television and assisting her would be David Gerald 
who wrote the script for the original Star Trek episode, The Trouble with Tribbles. They've characterized this show as essentially a fourth season of the original series, which, if you watch this show after the three seasons of the original series, you kind of sort of get, because like I said before, they were basically looking to recreate the whole vibe of the show. Yes. And what better way to recreate the whole vibe than to get the cast on board? Originally, Filmation just wanted William Shatner, Leonard Nimoy, Forrest Kelly, James Dewan, and Magel Barrett. Dewan and Barrett would voice Sulu and Uhura. Yeah. Oh, that's... No. 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 Yeah, uh, this got to a point where Letter D-Boy said, I am not going to be Spock until you cast Michelle and George. Because, A, they reflect the diversity of the 23rd century, and to be recast would pretty much slap that in the face. And B, you really did not notice that you are basically shutting out two people of color. Yeah. But he didn't really, I don't think he really saw it that way, because uh, according to Truth by Consensus Wikipedia here, he knew that uh, many of the cast members were facing financial troubles after the series was canceled. I mean, when you are Captain Kirk, it's impossible to see yourself as anything but Captain Kirk. Or maybe T.J. Hooker. Or maybe Denny Crane. Or maybe the chairman of the American Gourmet Academy. That's a deep cut. So, Lou Scheimer relented and cast the remaining holdouts from the cast. An interesting thing, normally when you are voicing a cartoon... It's you in a studio with a microphone and a script and a video just to make sure everything's all on the same page. Right? Yes. This show was recorded as basically a mic'd table read. It was recorded as an ensemble. Everyone was in the room at the same time. Oh, that's nice. It's like they film... It was like filming an episode or... Recording an audio drama, a big finish Doctor Who audio drama. Yeah, it's basically what this was in 1973. We didn't really have big finish yet to do that sort of thing. But yeah, this was close enough. I mean, if big finish was around like in 1973, I'm sure there would have been like Star Trek audio dramas on like LPs all over the place. Oh, yeah. But aside from reprising their characters... James Doohan and Magel Barrett would also join the staple of Filmation house cast members and voice at least, and I'm getting this number here, 51 different characters. Wow. 51. 51. That's a ton. That's a lot. Yep. Well, that's what they do. They were going to create, it's like, we want to create this big, expansive world, but we don't want to spend a lot of money. What do you mean, Lou Scheimer didn't want to spend a lot of money? Yeah, that's not like Lou Scheimer. Not at all. Well, let's be honest, guys. This is the guy whose animation studio drew a giant dildo copter in that E Man Christmas special. <laughs> And nobody saw any problem with that. Nobody noticed this could be a little inappropriate. Nope. Yeah, and here's the thing. When they got the entire cast to reprise their role, there was almost no money left for the animation. Oh! 
So they took what little money they had, spent it all in the cast, and now we have nothing for animation. We got what are no, we going to do? What are we going to do? We got no money for the animation. How are we going to draw all this? Well, they took shortcuts. Uh, they rotoscoped oh. only three cuts of the Enterprise in motion. And it looks, you know what? The storytelling was incredible. The animation looks absolutely god awful. Oh, it looks like crap. It's like uh, even the opening, which basically recreated the original series opening. Oh, yeah. You could definitely see how cheap it is. Oh, yeah. You could definitely tell the Lushimer made that for like the grand total of like. Less than 50 bucks. But that wasn't all they did, aside from uh, rotoscoping original cuts at the Enterprise. They also looked for an excuse, a dramatic excuse, to limit animation as much as possible. From keeping characters that are difficult to animate behind a desk, to covering their mouth when they speak like this. Oh, oh yeah, you know, you know my mouth is moving, but you don't see it. Oh yeah, they use like the same shot of like Spock looking at a viewfinder like many times during this series. And there's also uh, silhouetting characters. It's like they're moving, they're talking about something. You can see their shadows, but you can't see much of anything else. Oh, and they also, as you probably could tell, they did not use the Alexander Courage theme music. No, of course not. They wouldn't want to spend the money on that. Gene Roddenberry didn't want to spend the money on that. I don't know if you know the story, but Gene Roddenberry wrote lyrics to the original theme music just so Alexander Courage would be paid half of what he's owed instead of the whole thing. Just because they didn't want to pay him. In fact, I have it right here. According to Gerald, when Courage turned in the original music, Roddenberry added his own lyrics to it, thereby depriving Courage of half his residuals. Courage never forgave Roddenberry and refused to give permission for the reuse of the theme. That's why new music was written for the animated series and again for the movies. Oh, so because of that, we have had to thank for the Jerry Goldsmith music that was used on Next Generation. Mm-hmm. From TMB. Oh, that's terrific. Yep. But for this theme music, we have Ray Ellis. And if that theme sounds familiar, he was very prolific in the 80s for uh, Reg Grundy. He did, with his son Mark, Sale of the Century and Scrabble. Oh, that's great. He did the Sale of the Century and Scrabble music. He also did Hot Streak, Scattergories, and Time Machine. So we have to hear oh, from John. Oh, Time Machine! Oh, wait, 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 wait. Let's hear from John now. John, what do you think about this show, Star Trek, the animated series? We plan to be here for a very long time. <laughs> We're going to be around a It's going to be around a very long time. And ladies and gentlemen, that was... And I now new running gag. Yep. And now Chuck Testa with a rebuttal. Nope. Oh, by the way, he also composed the theme music to Catchphrase. TV show that was before its time. The Art James version of Catchphrase? The Art James version of Catchphrase. Oh, that's terrific. Um, by the way, uh, uh, other non-game show TV shows that he scored, Arc 2... Jason of Star Command, which we talked about. Sabrina the Teenage Witch, the animated series. Not that animated series, but the other animated series. Oh, the one that doesn't have Melissa Joan Hart. The one that doesn't have Melissa Joan Hart or her sister Emily. And, Greg, the original Spider-Man cartoons. Oh, the ones from like 67? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's terrific. So wait, he did, he, he did back, no, he did background and incidental music. Okay, the not that season. theme from the not, no, not the theme music. He did the incidental and background music. Okay, well that's a shame he didn't do the famous theme from the '67 show, which, as we know, in the Tasm universe of Spider-Man, 
Everyone somehow knows this theme. Refer back to episode five of Into the Spidey Universe. Somehow, in the Andrew Garfield Tasm universe, everyone knows the song. They say it's a big hit. But they don't, for some reason, associate it with Spider-Man. Okay. Whatever gets you to bed at night. So we talked about the animation. We talked about the music. We talked about the cast getting back together. We didn't talk about how this was basically the uh, final two years of the original five-year voyage, did we? No, but I mean, you could pretty much figure that out. Yeah. In fact, legend has it that if this went on to uh, a proper series finale, it would have the Enterprise being retrofitted to what we would see in Star Trek The Motion Picture as it returns to Earth. Or Earth orbit, I guess you could say. Well, it doesn't really go to Earth orbit because it, like, we learned like, that, did they even establish Star Dock as like a thing? Greg, you moron! It is called Space Dock, not Star Dock. Get it right, Einstein? I don't think they ever established it until Star Trek: The Motion Picture. Yeah, because as yeah, it's just like in a hangar somewhere. It's in a space, floating hangar in space above the Earth. Yeah, I mean, if you're talking about an actual factual star dock, you have to go, I want to say, you have to go all the way to uh, the J.J. Abrams film, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, something like that. They built the Enterprise on Earth and somehow got it up there. Okay. Sure, that works. I'm good. But yeah, let's go into these animated voyages of the Starship Enterprise. Yes. Oh, by the way, one thing before we should note. Everyone from the original cast is back, except for Walter Koenig. But they did offer a bit of a trade-off, and he did take him up on it. You'll see what that was in a moment. Yes, but let's go on to episode one. Beyond the Farthest Star. Written by Samuel A. Peoples, who wrote the original second pilot where no man has gone before, and directed, like all season one episodes, by the filmation legend Hal Sutherland. While exploring the outermost rim of the galaxy, the Federation Starship Enterprise is pulled into the orbit of a dead star. Trapped there, the crew discovers that there's a massive derelict 300 million year old pod ship trapped with them as well. Kirk beams aboard the starship with Spock, McCoy, and Scott, where they learned it was once home to an insectoid race. They also learned from a pre recorded message that the ship had become almost completely controlled by a malevolent entity seeking to escape the dead sun and travel to other worlds. They created an isolation chamber that the entity did not control, and from there recorded a message that had their ship self-destruct rather than let it be used by the entity. Infiltrating the workings of the ship, it disables the self-destruct mechanism, but Spock has placed the navigation console inside a static shield, so it cannot steer the ship. Instead, it uses the ship's systems to threaten the crew's lives and thereby coerce Kirk to navigate the ship according to its orders. Kirk flies the Enterprise toward the Dead Star in what appears to be a suicide run, but in actuality is a slingshot maneuver for escaping its massive gravity. The entity believes the ship will crash and be destroyed, and so flees with the Enterprise successfully escaping both it and the Dead Star. And here's the thing. The thing you have to understand about these episodes, they were written... Like they were Star Trek episodes. They are written as Star Trek episodes. Yes. Although some of the uh, things that you would see in the primetime edition of the show obviously had to be scaled back or toned down for a Saturday morning audience. Episode 2. Yesteryear. Spock and Kirk returned from a time-traveling research project they had been conducting with the use of the Guardian of Forever and Starfleet historians. When they emerged from the portal, no one from on board the Federation Starship Enterprise recognizes Spock. The ship's first officer, 
is instead an Andorian named Commander Thelen. In this timeline, history records that Spock died at age 7 undergoing the Kaswan ordeal on Vulcan. However, Spock remembers that when he took the Kaswan, his life was saved by Selic, an adult relative, when a desert creature with poisonous claws called a Lamatia attacked them. Kirk hypothesizes that Selic was actually a time-traveling Spock. While Wh- Kirk and Sp- Wait, what? A time-traveling Spock. This is at least 100 years before Seven of Nine of Voyager discovers that Starfleet has time ships. At least. Anyway, Kirk and Spock are in the portal. The Guardians and Historians have run a scan of recent Vulcan history, and they realize, as they were observing the birth of Orion at the time, Spock could not have been in two places at once to save himself as a child. So Spock has to go back through the time gate and save the life of the child he was. Felon is supportive of Spock's efforts, despite the consequences on his own existence. Spock assumes the identity of Selick, a distant cousin of Sarek, and is welcomed into the home of Sarek and Amanda Grayson. Selick journeys into the desert, finds his younger self, saves the boy. However, Ichaya, Spock's pet Selot, is gravely wounded. Spock, the younger, runs to fetch a healer. The healer tends to the wounds and informs Selick and Spock that it's too late for an antidote. He can only prolong Ichaya's life, during which he will be in pain from the poison, or euthanize him. Young Spock chooses the latter, and by making this choice, Spock has thus chosen the Vulcan way of life, logic, and emotional control, and his elder self, successful in repairing history, returns to the restored present day, but not before teaching his younger self how to perform the Vulcan nerve pinch in order to deal with some school bullies. <laughs> So I I love the fact that Spock just goes into his dad and mom's house and says, "Oh yeah, hey yeah, I'm a younger cousin, and I'm a distant relative." And they're like, "Okay, that checks out." I want to say it was Amanda. No, uh, this episode was actually written by DC Fontana, who knows Star Trek. More than anyone except maybe Gene Roddenberry. Yeah. Oh, and they actually got Mark Leonard back to reprise the role of Sarek in this episode. But here's one fact I noticed on uh, Troop by Consensus Wikipedia. Los Angeles area stations aired this episode as the series premiere instead of Beyond the Farthest Star, and that was to avoid dealing with the FCC's equal time rule because at the time... George Takei was running for public office in L.A. Is that worth an oh my or an oh neat? How about about both? both? Oh neat! Oh my! Episode 3. One of our planets is missing. I don't know how this happened! One of our planets is missing! Y'all, anybody see a damn planet? Where did it go? This is the last time we let Tom post and run security on a planet. What? One of the planets just disappeared into thin air? Oh, no! Written by Mark Daniels, who was a veteran Star Trek director before writing out Life with Lucy. The Enterprise must contend with a massive space cloud that eats planets and now is targeting a Federation colony of over 82 million inhabitants. They determine it's heading for Mantilles, which is home to that colony, and governed by retired Starfleet officer Robert Wesley. Kirk contacts Wesley, but only has enough time in starships to evacuate a tiny fraction of the planet's children. When phasers have no effects, Kirk takes the Enterprise inside the cloud in an attempt to stop it. Avoiding obstacles and proceeding from one chamber to another, the ship begins to lose power. Scott beams aboard a special container to replenish the warp drive engines, while Spock discovers that the cloud has a brain. Kirk orders preparations to be made to self-destruct the Enterprise in the creature's brain in order to kill it. 
Seeking an alternative to loss of life, however, he suggests Spock use a Vulcan mind meld to communicate with the entity. Since physical contact with the entity is impossible, the ship's sensors are focused on the electrical impulses of the entity's synapses, translating them into thought in order to accomplish the mind meld. Spock tells it that there is life on the planet and it plans to consume and allows it to perceive them through Spock's own eyes. Not wanting to kill other life forms, the cloud entity agrees to leave the Enterprise alone and return to its place of origin. So Spock mind melds with a cloud? Spock mind melds with a cloud. How is that possible? It's a cartoon. Okay. Episode 4. The Lorelei Signal. Written by Margaret Arman, who wrote three episodes of the original series. The Federation Starship Enterprise investigates a sector of space where starships have been disappearing every 27.346 years. Every 27 years, a starship just disappears in this one sector. Eh. And a compelling musical signal lures the Enterprise to a remote planet in the Torian system. The music works on the men of the Enterprise, affecting their judgment and causing them to experience euphoric hallucinations. <laughs> Kirk, Spock, McCoy, and Carver beam down to the source of the signals and finds the inhabitants are a race of beautiful women who want to celebrate their arrival. Ooh! That's exactly what I want to have happen to me. I'm surprised they didn't do the whole foggy scene bit. On board the Enterprise, Uhura and Nurse Chapel talk about the men's condition and conclude that she must take command due to the euphoric state of Scott. I should note that as the uh, crew indulges in the entertainments the women offer, they find themselves in a lethargic state and rapidly aging. Uh Uh Uh-oh! Yeah, these headbands locked around their foreheads transmit their life force to the women who are growing in strength. Oh, no. Uhura beams down with Chapel and an all-female security force. So, this is basically Wakanda. Something the like natives, that. When the natives try to force them to leave, they stun them with their phasers. When Uhura threatens to destroy their temple, the Torian women explain how they came to be in their current situation. And every 27 years, they must lure males and drain their life forces to stay alive. That rates. Oh, this makes total sense now. Okay, that explains why all these starships are disappearing every 27 years. At Ahura's urging, the Torian women help locate the male landing party who are drowning in the urn due to a rainstorm. Female landing party frees them using their phasers. The aging process is stopped with the removal of the headbands, but they cannot find a treatment to restore their original age. Bot comes up with the idea of using their original transporter patterns, from when they first beamed down. The Torian leader, Thela, destroys the device they've been using to lure starships, stating that Uhura should tell Kirk she kept her side of the bargain. Uhura informs them that a ship of women will return to bring them to a habitable world, and that women's bodies should return to normal in a few moments. Okay, remember when I said that uh, many of the cast members voiced people who were not their original character? Yes. Magil Barrett, in addition to voicing Nurse Chapel, voiced Thela, the head of the Torian women. Nichelle Nichols, in addition to voicing Uhura, voiced Security Officer Lieutenant Davison. And James Dewan, in addition to voicing Scotty, voiced Lieutenant Carver. And this is actually the first time that Lieutenant Uhura gets to command the Enterprise. Yes! In fact, Nichelle Nichols, rest in peace, yelled happily, according to Lou Scheimer, What, you're kidding? I actually get to run the Enterprise? Really? And in all of Star Trek lore, before Voyager, of course, this is one of three times that a woman commands the Enterprise, the other two being number one in The Cage and Dr. Lester in Turnabout Intruder. Oh yeah, that was a bad, insane episode. Turnabout intruder. 
That was, I believe, the last year and episode of the original series, and oh god, that is terrible. Yeah. All right, here we go. This is the big episode here. Episode five. More troubles. More troubles. And this is, of course, a sequel to The Trouble with Tribbles. And, of course, as I mentioned all the way back when we did Colcheck the Night Stalker, which had Stanley Adams, who played Cyrano Jones in the original series episode of The Trouble with Tribbles, I mentioned that he reprised his role as Cyrano Jones in this episode. So, okay, Chico. Let's get on with the plot of this episode. Okay, the Enterprise escorts two robot cargo ships carrying a new seed grain to a famine-stricken planet. It encounters a Klingon battlecruiser commanded by Captain Koloth firing on a Federation scout ship. The Enterprise beams the pilot aboard. The Klingons use a new energy weapon which incapacitates the starship and demands they hand over the pilot. Spock hypothesizes that such a powerful weapon must require all of the Klingon ship's energy, and Uhura notices that the two cargo ships have not been disabled. Kirk has the cargo ships set a course to ram into the Klingon ship. With the energy expended, the Klingon ship is forced to flee, but damages one of the cargo ships. Since the Enterprise cargo hold lacks sufficient space, the crew must dangerously load the ship's decks with the grain. The pilot is Cyrano Jones. He got out of this task of cleaning up the Tribbles on Space Station K-7 using a glomer which preys on Tribbles. Jones is now selling safe Tribbles genetically engineered to be sterile. Now, hold on. When he says safe Tribbles, he means safe, safe tribbles. tribbles. The Klingons attack again, disabling the engines of the remaining cargo ship and bathing the Enterprise in a radiation which rapidly increases the growth of the Tribbles aboard. Uh oh! Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Kirk still refuses to hand over Jones, ostensibly because he is a Federation citizen, but actually because he suspects the Klingons would not have violated Federation space unless Jones were of great value to them. That sounds like a very Picard move, let me tell you. The Klingons again use their new weapon, and Kirk responds by having the Tribbles beamed over to their ship. <laughs> <laughs> Got you! The Klingons are like, oh no! He tricked us, now we got all these Tribbles! Ah, how are we going to deal with all these Tribbles now on this ship? I thought there were going to be less Tribbles. No, there's going to be more Tribbles. This is a horrible vacation! Oh, now Kolov is admitting, oh, the Klingon plans, they're now being overrun by these Tribbles! The Gloomer, which was created by the Klingons via genetic engineering and stolen by Jones, is their only hope of controlling these Tribbles. So Kirk returns it, but the huge Tribbles scare it away. So Kolov orders his first officer to shoot the large Tribble, only to inadvertently free smaller ones inside. So Dr. McCoy, having discovered in advance that the large Tribbles are actually Tribble colonies, injects the remaining Tribbles on the Enterprise with a serum to slow down their metabolic rate. But okay, the best part in the episode is after everything is all done, Kirk's like... He'd, Kirk opens up like a... Like in the original episode, he opens up like one of the things up above on the ship. And all the Tribbles come pouring down on him. And he's like, Someday I'll learn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. Episode 6. The Survivor. This is James Shermer's only written credit in the Star Trek franchise. The Enterprise is patrolling the Romulan neutral zone, and they find a small private ship flown by a Mandorian, an alien species that can transform its shape at will. The alien dupes the Enterprise crew by assuming the form of Carter Winston, a Federation citizen and philanthropist who had been missing for five years. His fiancée, Lieutenant Ann Norad, happens to serve as security officer aboard the Enterprise. Upon their reunion, he breaks off their engagement, 
without explanation. Hmm. The Vendorian renders Kirk unconscious, takes his form, and orders the helmsman, Sulu, to steer the Enterprise into the neutral zone where Romulan warbirds lie in wait. The real Kirk regains consciousness, and he is bound again. Meanwhile, Bones and Spock become suspicious when Bones allows that he might have made a mistake. Something the real McCoy, <laughs> the real McCoy, would never admit to. And a new examination table materializes in the medical bay. They force the Vendorian to reveal his true form, and the alert is sounded. The Vendorian escapes detection and disables the Enterprise deflector shields leaving it vulnerable to Romulan attack. While its presence in the neutral zone gives the Romulans a pretext to destroy the Enterprise. Ursula hears Kirk rummaging around as she releases him. He then explains that the Vendorian was in league with the Romulans from the beginning. The Vendorian takes the form of a deflector shield around the Enterprise and the Romulans retreat. The Vendorian shows himself to the Enterprise crew and explains that the nature of his kind is to gradually assume the memories and personal traits of those they impersonate. Because he spent too much time in the form of Carter Winston, he became unwilling to let the Enterprise crew be killed. He is arrested and will face trial, but Kirk tells him that his actions to protect the Enterprise will be taken into consideration. Norad volunteers to guard the Vendorian, saying that he has become similar enough to Winston that she has feelings of love for him. Aww. But okay, playing the Vendorian, doing the voice... Uh, we don't have many guest stars in this series, but you know what? This is a big name. Ted Knight. Well, we're waiting. Monroe. And seriously, guys, if you don't know who Ted Knight is, just stop. No. Just, just go. Why? Just go. Why? Why? Go. Why? Go. Episode seven. The Infinite Vulcan. On a planet of intelligent plant-like creatures, the clone of a human scientist clones Mr. Spock for use in a galactic peace mission. Lieutenant Sulu picks up a walking plant called a Retlaw and is poisoned by a stinger. The alien begins to inhabit the planet, approach the Enterprise landing party, and their leader, Agambar, saves Sulu's life. The Pelosians say they were nearly wiped out by a mild terrestrial disease that was brought to the planet by Dr. Stavros Kanikulis, a Terran scientist who survived Earth's eugenics wars. A giant clone of that doctor, named Kanikulis V, kidnaps Spock. He believes the galaxy is as war-ravaged as Earth was when he left it and plans to enforce peace in the galaxy with the aid of a fleet of Pelosian ships and a giant clone of Spock that he's created by transferring Spock's consciousness into it, leaving Spock's original body a mindless shell. The newly awakened Spock, too, uses his Vulcan telepathic abilities to mind meld with his original self and save his life. The two Spocks, in concert with Kirk, convince the Doctor that the need for his plan no longer exists. Spock, too, and Caniculus V devote themselves to restoring the Felosian civilization as Spock I departs with his shipmates. Remember when we said that a trade-off was made when Chekhov was not on board the ship? Yeah, this is it. This is the trade-off. Because as if the name of the plant wasn't a dead giveaway enough, this episode was written by Walter Koenig. And in fact, I believe, according to Truth by Consensus Wikipedia, in 2016, the Hollywood Reporter rated this episode the 74th best episode of all Star Trek episodes. That's a lot of episodes. Yeah. Episode 8. The Magics of Megas 2. Megas 2. While exploring near the center of the galaxy, the Enterprise is caught inside an energy matter vortex and its computer systems fail. A being named Lucian appears on the bridge, repairs the ship's systems, and takes the crew to explore his planet, Megas 2, on which differing physical laws allow the existence of magic and witchcraft. Suddenly fearful at the approach of other Megans, 
Lucian teleports the crew back onto the Enterprise to prevent them from being discovered. While waiting, the Enterprise crew experiment with magic. Lucian warns the crew that their experiments will draw unwanted attention, but it's too late. The crew are transported to what appears to be Salem during a witch trial in 1691. The Megans are an ageless species that at one time lived on Earth. Contrary to modern assumption, those executed during the witch trials were all real witches, which is how the Megans were driven from Earth. The Megans put humanity and the Enterprise crew on trial for what humans did to their people. Kirk testifies that humanity has progressed since 1691. On examining their ship's records, the Megans conclude the Enterprise coming to Megas 2 was a freak accident and they need not fear human incursion. However, Lucian is condemned to eternal isolation for bringing humans to the Megan's world. Kirk argues that this is unreasonably core punishment in the case of Lucian, who alone among the Megans sought out humans for companionship. The Megans claim Lucian is Lucifer, but Kirk only scoffs at this as he does not believe in the history of Christian traditions and engages the Megans in a magical battle to determine Lucian's fate. The Megans then reveal that their threat to punish Lucian was only a test to determine if humanity had truly changed. On the basis of Kirk's compassion, they would welcome future human visits to their planet. Larry Brody wrote this episode, and I don't think I remember a Trek project with him. In fact, his greatest writings were still to come with Auto Man, Spider Man the Animated Series, Silver Surfer, The Magician, and The Streets of San Francisco. Oh, The Magician. Bill Bixby as a magician. <laughs> okay. Bill Bixby as a magician. All right. I'll buy, I'll buy that. Certainly could not be worse than Good Night Bean Town. Episode 9 Once Upon a Planet. The Enterprise revisits a fondly remembered amusement park planet, hoping for some rest and relaxation. However, Shortly after landing, Bones is attacked by the Queen of Hearts and Lieutenant Uhura is captured by the planet's master computer who has come to resent being made to serve others and seeks to use the Enterprise to travel the galaxy in search of other computers. To this end, it takes control of the Enterprise computer and starts manipulating the ship's systems. Searching for Uhura, a landing party discovers the grave of the planet's caretaker who had overseen the operations of the facility. The untended machinery is constructing dangerous images from the crew members' thoughts and its own imagination. Recalling how the planet took care of McCoy after his fatal injury in Shore Leave, original episode, 15th episode of the first season, Spock has McCoy inject him with Melanex to create the semblance of injury and thus prompt the planet's automated systems to bring him into the underground complex. Kirk follows him. After interviewing the angry computer, Kirk persuades it that its notion of servitude is simplistic by revealing that, contrary to its assumption, they are not slaves of the Enterprise. He convinces it that its best course is to resume business as usual, as it will be rewarded with social contact by the many guests attracted by the planet's facilities and can, in time, learn everything it could possibly want to without leaving its home planet. Oh, great. It's Westworld. Episode 10, Mud's Passion. Written by Stephen Candell, who wrote the previous Mud episode in the original series' is I, Mud. The Enterprise receives orders to arrest Federation outlaw Harry Mud, who is accused of selling fake love crystals. Intercepting Mud on the mining colony of Motherlode, they bring him aboard the Enterprise. <laughs> Love crystals <laughs> on a that's a guy mother love. Mud explains that he escaped the custody of the android planet by stealing a ship, and while on Ilria Six, Mud committed fraud by selling Starfleet Space Academy to its inhabitants. His sailor did enough credits to go to Sirius Nine, which is Motherload. <laughs> After convincing Chapel to use a love crystal to win the affection of Spock, Mud abducts her, steals a shuttlecraft, escapes to a rocky planet, and battles Chapel 
At which point, some of his love crystals are broken near an air vent. <laughs> oh, no! Oh, no! What? The love crystal affects Spock! Make him insist on pursuing Mud to the planet, accompanied by Kirk! <laughs> and the, uh, the love crystal affects the entire crew of the Enterprise. Kirk and Spock find Chapel and Mud, but the four of them are attacked by creatures made of rock which inhabit the planet. Moreover, a new phase of the Love Crystal's influence causes them to bicker with each other while the ship's crew are too intoxicated by the Love Crystal to beam them back up. To buy time, Kirk throws the remaining Love Crystals to the rock creatures, and the four are beamed back to the Enterprise, where Spock notes that the Love Crystal's short duration and after effects of enmity makes them of little value. And Chapel records a confession of Mud's misdeeds since his escape from the android planet, so he can be returned to rehabilitation. <laughs> what a screwed up episode this is! Roger C. Carmel reprises his role as Harry Mud. Episode 11 The Terratin Incident. Written by original scribe Paul Schneider. After an apparent attack, the Enterprise crew find themselves beginning to shrink in size toward the point that they will no longer be able to control the ship. While observing a burnt-out supernova, the Enterprise picks up a strange message transmitted in a 200-year-old Earth code. The signal is traced to a nearby planet. When the Enterprise enters orbit, it's hit by an energy beam of spiroid radiation that damages its dilithium crystals and makes the crew begin to shrink along with all other organic material aboard the ship, including the crew's uniforms. Kirk beams down to the surface and finds that the transporter can revert crew members to their original size. He also observes what appears to be a miniature city. Kirk returns to the ship, but the crew are now too small for him to see easily and too small to operate the ship's controls. Meanwhile, the Terratons have beamed the bridge crew down to their inner city, where the crew learns the Terratin fate. Terratin is a lost Earth colony, originally called Terra-10. Its inhabitants have mutated because of the supernova's radiation, and now are all approximately one sixteenth of an inch in height. The beam which caused the crew to shrink was not intended as an attack, but it was the only way the Terratons had to draw attention to themselves. The crew are beamed back to the ship and return to normal size. However, the Terratons have been small for generations and cannot be restored to normal size. Their planet is in peril from massive volcanic activity. The whole Terratin city is beamed aboard the Enterprise and moved to another planet. Episode 12, The Time Trap. On starting 5267.2, while exploring the Delta Triangle, where many starships have disappeared, the Enterprise is attacked by several Klingon vessels. During the battle, they're caught by an ion storm, and the Enterprise and one Klingon battlecruiser are drawn into a space-time vortex and end up in a timeless dimension in what could only be called a graveyard for space vessels. Kirk and the crew are shocked to find that the descendants of the crews of these various vessels are still alive, and have formed a government calling themselves the Elysian Council. The crew discovers that the time warp will gradually disintegrate the Enterprise's dilithium crystals. Their only means of escape is to link their ship with the Klingons and their commander, Kor, and try to power themselves out of the vortex. Kor is voiced by James Dewan. The actor who usually played Kor, John Colicos, was not available at the time. Okay, Jim. I'm sure, yeah, dude, yeah, just, yeah, that's fine. You can just voice him instead. Yeah. And, uh, oh, and fun fact, this was the first ever reference of a Starfleet starship other than a Constitution-class starship, the USS Bonaventure, which is said to be the first ship to have warp drive installed. I don't believe that is the name of the ship that Zephram Cochran flew in First Contact. Though. No, because obviously this would have been a good 23 years before that movie came out. 
Episode 13, the ambergris element, or the ambergris element. For ambergris of grain. Boo. Oh my um, gosh, Greg. No, Greg, that was horrible. What? Boo. You could have made a reference to the ambergris episode of Bob's Burgers. I'm not really a big Bob's Burgers guy. My brother and sister-in-law are the Bob's Burgers marks. You don't know what you're missing. Yeah, yeah you're missing quite a bit. The Ambergris episode or Ambergris episode is one of the better episodes. The planet Argo, transformed into a water planet by psychic disturbances, gets a visit from our Enterprise where Kirk and Spock are lost from their survey party when their aqua shuttle is attacked by a giant sea creature. They released the Kraken, y'all. After a lengthy search, the two are found mysteriously transformed into water breathers. Bones' analysis indicates that this could not have been accomplished by any natural process, leading to the conclusion that intelligent life must still exist on the planet, but under the seas. In order to return to their normal selves, Kirk and Spock must seek out the intelligent life forms responsible for their transformation. Since the Aqua Shuttle was destroyed when the sea creatures attacked them, they swim to search for answers. They encounter a group of Aquans who express fear and disgust before swimming away. Kirk and Spock follow them from a distance and are captured as they admire the Aquans' underwater city. They're taken to a tribune where they are accused of being spies. One council member, Rila, stands up for them, asking that they be given a chance to explain themselves. Unfortunately, the meeting is interrupted by... Aquin to report that three air breathers have invaded the sea foliage. They are informing Kirk and Spock of an impending sea quake. The leader of the council decides that Kirk and Spock are to be brought to the surface and left there to suffocate. Uh oh. Uh oh. Rila, the sole sympathetic council member, saves their lives by leading the assistance party to them. She then explains the Aquan history that led to their fear of air breathers, revealing that reverse mutation is possible, but forbidden. Despite the ban, Kirk enlists the help in locating the lost formula for reversing the transformation and capturing a giant sur snake whose venom is the key to the antidote. Magil Barrett voices all of the female voices in this episode. James Dewan voices several Aquans. And the High Tribune, with Lou Scheimer himself voicing Lemus. Episode 14, The Slaver Weapon. Three guesses what this one is about. The shuttlecraft Copernicus carrying Spock, Uhura, and Sulu are en route to Starbase 25 to deliver a stasis box, a rare artifact of the slaver culture. The now extinct slavers use these objects to carry weapons, valuables, scientific instruments, and data. The boxes can detect each other, and evidence shows that another device is located near Beta Lyra. Following the signal, the shuttle lands on an ice planet, where the crew is captured by the hostile cat-like Kazinti. The Kazinti had an empty stasis box of their own, and were using it to lure in passing starships. Trying to steal the boxes in hopes of finding a super weapon that will return their empire to its former greatness. They open the box that the Enterprise had, finding some fresh meat, a picture of a slaver, and a powerful but unfamiliar alien device, which the Kazinti immediately suspect as a weapon. The weapon passes hands several times between the Federation and Kazinti crew, during which time Sulu discovers a total conversion beam setting. The Kazinti recaptures all three Federation personnel and the weapon. As they explore the device's many settings, they discover a war computer that starts talking to them. After the Kazinti fail to provide several code words and ask about the total conversion beam setting, the weapon concludes that they are enemies and directs them to what it claims is the setting that they want, but which is actually a self-destruct setting. When the Kazinti activate that setting, it turns out to be a disruptor field that destroys the weapon and kills the Kazinti. This episode was written by Larry Niven, who is best known for Ringworld and other science fiction legends. Based on, actually, yeah, 
Uh, Larry Niven actually wrote the short story on which this episode was based, The Soft Weapon. Episode 15, The Eye of the Beholder. The USS Enterprise investigates the disappearance of a scientific team near Lectra 7. The Starship Ariel is located there, abandoned, with its captain having transported to the planet's surface. The crew beams down to discover a series of unusual environments, and are captured by the Lactans, large slug-like beings with intellectual capacities far beyond their own. Fox senses that they are telepathic, but communicating at a speed too fast to comprehend. The team is installed in a zoo collection with the surviving crew members of the Ariel, one of whom is deathly ill. Medical officer Bones determines he could cure her if he had the medical kit, but it was confiscated along with their faces and communicators. Oh, no. Yeah. After the aerial crew informs them that the Lactrans attempt to fulfill their captive's needs in response to impressions they pick up in their thoughts, Kirk directs everyone to focus on the mental image of McCoy's medical kit. Guess what happens? The kit gets delivered. Then he suggests focusing on a communicator. Kirk calls for a beam-up. The youngster snatches away the communicator and is beamed aboard the ship in their place. The adult Lactrans, upset that their child has disappeared, focus their telepathic energy on Kirk, seeking an explanation. Due to the speed of their thoughts, this runs the risk of destroying Kirk's mind, so the other Starfleet officers project a mental barrier to protect Kirk. The youth probes Scotty's mind and processes the ship's entire library system. It proceeds to take the Enterprise galloping out of orbit, and the child beams back down with Scotty. The youngster communicates what it learned, and the adults decide that although still primitive, humans and Vulcans are in the process of evolving to a higher order, and are set free with the message that they will be welcomed back in a number of centuries. Yeah, this bears a bit of similarity to the original pilot, The Cage, if I'm not mistaken. Not surprisingly, David Harmon, uh, who wrote The Deadly Years and A Piece of the Action, also wrote this one. And the season finale of the first season, The Jihad. Enterprise arrives at the Vidala asteroid, where Kirk and Spock have been summoned to take part in the latest of several failed secret quests to learn about a stolen religious artifact, the Soul of the Score, the theft of which could ignite a galactic holy war. Joining Kirk and Spock is a team of specialists called in to help recover the item, which has been hidden on a very unstable and dangerous planet. The focal point of this mission, as the primary stakeholder, is Char, the hereditary prince of the score. The muscle of the team is provided by Sword, a reptilian with great strength, an insectoid named M3 Green is a master lockpick. The team is rounded out by the huntress Lara, a humanoid who is an accomplished tracker with an impeccable sense of direction. Kirk and Spock soon learn that one member of the party is a saboteur. It seems that T'Char has stolen the artifact himself in an effort to return his people to their warrior ways. When the mission is completed, T'Char is held captive as insane, although with good prospects of rehabilitation. The Vidala states that they will eventually forget that these events ever happened. Kirk and Spock return to the Enterprise, where it seems that hardly any time at all has passed since their beam down to begin the mission. Uh, David Gerald, the uh, writer that we talked about, uh, guests as M3 Green. And that is the first season. And during the first season, this show aired at 10.30 opposite a forgettable genie animated show and an equally forgettable TV show on CBS, if I'm not mistaken. So they're not even important. We're not even going to bother to mention the shows. I'll tell you right now, it's a perfect environment for Star Trek to breathe and gain an audience, which it did. Yeah. You're wondering what show went up against Genie and Star Trek, the animated series, the first season? Uh-huh. On ABC, it was called Goober and the Ghost Chasers. Goober? What the hell is that? What in God's name is Goober? Goober and the Ghost Chasers. Well, it was a one-season uh, show 
that actually Wikipedia says ran for two years. Go figure the math on that one out. 16 episodes. And uh, it actually was part of the Cartoon Express back in uh, uh, the 80s uh, on uh, on USA. Oh, okay. Uh, so what it was, I'm going to just read it directly from, um, from Wikipedia here. It was similar to Scooby-Doo. Uh, featured a group of teenagers solving spooky mysteries with their Afghan hound-like dog, Goober. Writing for Ghost Chasers magazine, the group uses their equipment from the apparition kit, like the specter detector, the po- uh, poltergeist powder, etc., when it comes to determining whether a ghost is real or not. The major differences were that the ghosts they eventually find are real and would help in defeating the fake ghosts. Some of these people behind the mask of some fake ghosts are not criminals. Goober had the power to become invisible but could not control it, and his closest human companion is reckless instead of cowardly. Also, unlike Scooby-Doo, Goober can speak more clearly, but speaks only to break the fourth wall with a comment aimed at the viewers. Otherwise, he merely barks. And it had Ronnie Shell in it, Paul Winchell. Looks like all the Partridge kids appeared on episodes. Will Chamberlain appeared on an episode. What? Will Chamberlain appeared on an episode. Will Chamberlain appeared on an episode. Yeah, episode three uh, says Goober and the kids investigate Will Chamberlain's ranch after a report of a galloping ghost to get a story for their latest article for Ghost Chasers magazine. Who else was in Wilt Chamberlain's ranch when this happened? Wouldn't you like to know? I would like to know. <laughs> well, there's a reason he's famous. Maybe Wilt Chamberlain had some of those love crystals from that planet, <laughs> Chico. <laughs> oh, my oh, my God. Oh, my gosh. Did we oh, really my... just reference We that? just went called back to the love crystals. Oh, my gosh. Oh that my might God. explain why you slept with 20,000 women. Who Come knows? on! Wait, wait, hold, hold on, hold on. You guys are complaining about that. My damn Nugenics isn't working. Buzz, you son of a bitch. Oh boy. Oh yeah, now it doesn't buzz because my blood sugar has dropped in the last hour and a half from like three hundred down to one thirty-one. Holy, shit, I'm gonna die. Not before we finish this podcast. All right, so season two, it's yep. just six episodes. Season two is six episodes, and they changed out uh, Hal Sutherland for Bill Reed as director. Bill Reed? I don't think he's done much outside of Filmation. He does that. not have a Wikipedia page, so... He does have an IMDb page, and he is... Actually, he's been very, very busy. He functions mostly as a sheet timer, I want to say the most notable credit that he's had, and I am doing all sorts of diving right now, Scooby's Lap Olympics. Oh my god. Oh wait, my mistake. His most notable credit, 49 episodes of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. Oh. Wait, did he direct the, uh, the Christmas special? No. Oh, that's a shame. Oh, darn. I wanted to say he's the guy that directed the dildo copter. Let's go into season two, shall we? NBC kept the time slot. And we go into The Pirates of Orion. Written by Howard Weinstein, who was actually 19 at the time he wrote this. Making him the youngest writer of any Star Trek material. The Enterprise is on its way to Deneb 5 when Spock contracts the disease choreocytosis and is diagnosed by Bones with having only days to live. The Starfleet freighter Huron is to rendezvous with the Enterprise and deliver medicine direly needed for the cure when it is attacked by Orion pirates who steal its cargo, which turns out to be primarily a sizable load of dilithium crystals. The Enterprise follows back on the rendezvous course and finds the battered Huron and its surviving crew. Analysis of the attack leads Kirk and his crew to chase the Orion ship in a desperate attempt to recover the cure before time runs out. The Orions, knowing they cannot escape the Enterprise or beat him in a fight, 
plans to destroy both themselves and the Enterprise in order to protect the lie of Orion neutrality. Kurt meets with the Orion captain, voiced by James Doohan, on a highly unstable asteroid which the Orions plan to detonate to carry out their plot. Kirk and the Enterprise crew realize the Orion captain is carrying an explosive trigger in his pack and are able to neutralize it. They recover the medicine to save Spock, capture the Orion captain, orders his crew to abort the self-destruct, which would now be a pointless loss of life, and surrender, and retrieve the Delithium crystals. So, basically, Howard Weinstein mixed elements of Star Trek with elements of Lost in Space... Throw in a bit of NASA fandom, and you have animated gold. Okay. While you were recapping that, I was looking up Howard Weinstein, because uh, I, not necessarily him, but I noticed that he submitted a short story in a fanzine, which was a yearly publication in East Meadow High School, which is in Nassau County. So I went to the Wikipedia page of East Meadow High School, do you know who's an alumni of um, East Meadow High School? And we've mentioned him probably like a couple of times on this podcast. I'm going to know it when you tell me. Mike, you're going to love this. Lay it on us. Frank Viola. Okay. Because remember, we've mentioned constantly that legendary pitching duel between him and Ron Darling when they were at St. John's in Yale. We have, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, that's not going to be the last time this year we're going to be talking about that. Just wait another month and a half or so from now. Let's continue. Uh, The second episode of season two, which is called BEM. BEM. BEM, just BEM. Just BEM. The Enterprise is conducting a series of exploratory missions with honorary commander... Ari Bin Bem, a representative from the newly contacted planet Pandro, who is working for his government as an independent observer of the Federation. Bem accompanies a landing party on a mission to a newly discovered planet. Instead of observing, however, he begins to interfere with the mission. Before long, Kirk and his people are captured by primitive natives. They soon learn that these primitives are under the guardianship of a powerful non-corporeal entity who is upset that the Enterprise crew has come to her planet and interfered with her children. This actually began as a script for the original series' third season, but it was condensed and finally produced during this one. And I believe it won David Gerald a Hugo and a Nebula Award. Episode 3, The Practical Joker. Not to be confused with the impractical Joker. On star date 3183.3, the Federation Starship Enterprise is attacked by three Romulan D7 class battle cruisers. Captain Kirk orders the ship into a nearby gaseous energy field to hide, knowing that the Romulans would be unwilling to follow in after them. So, sometime later, the crew begin to suffer a series of practical jokes, beginning with glasses leaking and utensils turning to rubber, and a uniform tunic for the captain with a Kirk is a jerk and place it on the back, and a mysterious optical device on the bridge science station, which when looked into, leaves blackened circles around science officer Spock's eyes. Everyone suspects that there is a member of the crew having fun. The jokes become more serious, however, as corridor decks are found covered with ice under a concealing layer of fog. Still thinking that a crew member is responsible, McCoy, Uhura, and Sulu hope to escape the jokester by hiding out in the holodeck rec room. No escape is to be found as a quiet stroll in a woodland scene becomes dangerous, with the program parameters changing to include a deep pit covered over by branches and leaves, and later a freezing cold blinding snow, then a hedge maze before they are finally rescued. Eventually, the practical Joker turns out to be the Enterprise computer itself! What? This is nuts. The computer was like, you know what? I'm going to have some fun. You know what? I'm going to f*** with everyone on this crew. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay, so... The ship's got jokes. The ship's got jokes! Yes. 
So the ship decides, you know what? I'm going to play a joke on the Romulans for the battle damage caused in the earlier deck. It fabricates a gigantic ship-shaped balloon besides the Enterprise that the Romulans are drawn to attack. The Romulans are pissed over the embarrassment of being tricked, so they give chase, and Kirk shows extreme fear at the prospect of returning to the cloud to escape the Romulans. The Enterprise presses into Kirk's fear of taking the ship back in. The jokester personality of the computer begins to fade as it realizes it had been tricked itself and returns to normal. The Romulans, however, were so enraged over the balloon ship ruse that they follow the Enterprise through the energy crowd and begin to experience a rash of jokes themselves. Playing uh, a role of a couple of Romulan crewmen are Norm Prescott and Lou Scheimer. Because <laughs> filmation. Filmation. What a screwed up episode this is. This is nuts. This is absolutely bizarre. This is bizarre. Episode 4 of Season 2. Episode 20. Albatross. The Enterprise visits the planet Dromian to deliver medical supplies. And the authorities immediately arrest McCoy for mass murder. What? Well, this is very dark for a kid's show. Like I said, they write it to spec. The Dramians allege that 19 years earlier, McCoy had supervised an inoculation program on Dramia 2, and that once he had left, most of the inhabitants died from a plague. The Dramian government believes the plague must have been a result of McCoy's activities there. Kirk takes the Enterprise to drive me to investigate, where they find a survivor named Cole Ty, who was off-world at the time of the plague, but remembers being healed by McCoy and is willing to testify that the doctor is not a mass murderer. He's just a simple country doctor. En route back to Dramia, their prime witness begins to develop symptoms of the plague, marked by a change in the coloring of skin pigmentation. In the process, the crew is infected with the same plague, except for Spock, who appears to be immune due to his Vulcan heritage. With the entire ship's crew infected, Spock is forced to break McCoy out of jail on Dromia, first using the Vulcan nerve pinch that he learns way back in Season 1 to knock out a guard. And as we learned from that episode, he himself taught it to his younger self. I'm, isn't that a grandfather paradox? Wait, isn't it? What was that thing you talked about way back when? The bootstrap paradox? The bootstrap paradox? Oh, yep. Yeah, it's, um, it's not the grandfather paradox. It's the bootstrap paradox. That's right. Go all the way back to episode 58, Second Chance 1987 slash Boys Will Be Boys. Near death, Kirk realizes that the pigment's color change was actually caused by a spatial aurora. McCoy is now able to develop a cure, and the Dramians drop all charges against him. Oh, that's good. I should hope so, because otherwise, that would kind of be weird. All right, episode five of season two. Episode five. How Sharper... Then a serpent's tooth. The Enterprise is immobilized by an alien whose ship resembles a winged serpent. The alien claims to be Kukulkan, god of the ancient Mayan Aztec peoples of Earth. He says that he is actually a very long-lived benevolent entity who wants the humans to worship him, as the Mayans and Aztecs did. Upon resistance by the crew, he proclaims them thankless and transports Kirk, McCoy, and Scotty, and Ensign Walking Bear to his ship. Wait, what was Ensign Walking Bear? Ensign Walking Bear. I'm that guessing, is his actual last name. I'm guessing uh, a Native American. Okay, that makes sense. Yes. That would be very impressive, though, if it was actually a walking bear. Mm -hmm. That could talk. Mike, wouldn't that have been impressive if it was a walking bear that could talk? That would be pretty impressive, yes. By using technology similar to a holodeck, Kokokan makes them believe they're standing in the middle of an ancient city and warns them that he will only appear before them once they've solved the riddle of the city. Kurt concludes that he's visited many of the peoples on Earth based on the uh, environs of the city, but each took only a portion of what he taught them. 
but none of them ever fulfilled the complete instructions to signal his return. Kirk scales a huge pyramid in the center of the city and concludes that the sun will activate Kul Kukan's signaling device. He orders Bones and Scotty to turn huge serpent-headed statues toward the pyramid, and in doing so, the now-focused sunlight ignites the signaling device. Kul Kukan responds, Behold, my design is complete. See me now with your own eyes. Kul Kukan appears as a winged serpent. The city disappears only to make the group realize they were never really there. They now realize the collection of animals they see before them in small glass cages was exactly how they experienced the city. The animals are unaware of being on Kul Kukan's ship, much as the group thought they were actually in an ancient city. He demands that humans worship him, just as the ancients on Earth did, and grows angry when Kirk explains that mankind has grown up and no longer needs to worship him. Spock has figured out a way to release the Enterprise from Kul Kukan's beam and break free. Kul Kukan is angered and exclaims that he will smash the Enterprise to buy Spock some time. Kirk and Bones decide to break loose a Capellan power cat from one of Kul Kukan's glass cages. With the power cat threatening Kukukan, Kirk leaps at the animal and is able to sedate it with a hypo. Kirk again attempts to reason with Kukukan, conceding that while the alien did help humanity when it needed it, they no longer need his guidance. This was written by Russell Bates, who knows DC Fontana through Gene L. Kuhn, a person who he apprenticed under. And David Wise, who's a legendary writer who was under the wing of Ursula K. Le Guin, Frank Herbert, Harlan Ellison, Theodore Sturgeon, The Clarion Workshop. Yeah, some um, of the all-time legends of science fiction. Yes. And this episode, I believe, actually won a Daytime Emmy Award. Yep, for uh, Outstanding Children's Entertainment Series. And finally... The Counterclock Incident. This established the Enterprise's first captain as Robert April, who preceded Captain Pike. In this episode, the Enterprise is unwillingly pulled by a smaller craft into the heart of a supernova and finds itself in another universe, where Robert April, voiced by James Dewan, his wife Sarah, voiced by Nichelle Nichols, the first medical officer of the ship, and a lot of other people staffing the Enterprise. The Enterprise attempts to assist by grabbing the vessel, which is a vessel that is flying at fantastic speeds directly into a supernova near the planet Babel, with a tractor beam and locking onto it, but instead both ships are pulled through the supernova and into a negative universe where time flows backwards and everything works in a counterclockwise fashion. Consequently, everyone aboard the ship begins to grow younger. The young woman piloting the ship, Carla Five, also voiced by Nichols, takes them to their homeworld, Eret, Terra backwards, and seeks the help of her son, a much older man named Carl Four, also voiced by Dewan. In a race against time for the increasingly de-aging Enterprise crew, they work out a solution for getting back home. With Kirk and his crew reduced to children, April, now a 30-year-old man, retakes command and must bring the Enterprise to safely before it's too late. The attempt to get back home is successful, and then he and his wife Sarah use the transporter to restore themselves and the rest of their crew to their proper ages. Now this is a grandfather paradox. Yes. And I should note the character of Robert April is actually referenced in Star Trek Strange New Worlds on Paramount Plus because the character orders Captain Pike uh, on a rescue mission in the pilot, which is to that planet that Pike is in that situation that violates possibly the prime directive. And this whole escapade of reverse aging would be revisited in no less than three different episodes in the future. The TNG episode Too Short a Season, the TNG episode Rascals, which also featured a young Megan Parlin from Hang Time, and 
a Voyager episode named Innocence. Didn't one of those episodes involve Q? I don't know. I thought one of those episodes where they turned into children on TNG involved Q. That seems like something Q would do. That does seem very Q-like. But it's not Rascals. Oh, it's not ra. Oh, that's a shame. Oh, but you know what? In Rascals, you know who's in it? Brian Bonsall. As Alexander, yes. As Alexander, yes. And by the way, if you have not seen it on Rift Tracks, I highly recommend you buy or watch that movie Brian Ponsel's in. Blank check. That, not blank check, silly. Mikey. Oh, that one. Okay. That one where he plays that bastard kid who's like a murderer. Yep. Oh, God, he's scary as crap in that movie. But it's so hilariously bad, too. I highly recommend you see that on Rift Tracks. And that was the second season, which aired in the same time slot as the first season. But by the second season, they had company. Because on ABC, a little show called Super Friends premiered. Oh, that will do it. Super Friends. Oh, yep. but, but wait, come on. If that wasn't bad enough, do you know what was on CBS at the time? What was on CBS? <laughs> Sit down, Greg. The Hudson Brothers Razzle Dazzle Show. Oh, God. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I just wanted to lay that on you. That was great. You happy now, Mike? Look at the smile on my face. <laughs> All right, then. <laughs> I'm over the moon. This is great. I got a smile right here for you, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Star Trek was canceled at the end of the season again. But it would not be the last time that we see this particular iteration of the Starship Enterprise, as the show would rerun in several markets. It would also rerun on the Sci Fi Channel part of their uh, animation block from the early to mid-90s. It would also be on Nickelodeon for a time, if I'm not mistaken. And if you want to see these episodes for yourself, and I highly suggest that you do, they are all available, all 22 of them, on Paramount+. Plus. Yes! Okay, that makes sense. I was going to add that the uh, digital channel H and I Heroes and Icons, they aired this at like seven o'clock on Sunday nights. This is probably about I'm guessing six seven years ago or so. They haven't shown it since. That might be the reason why. But they have the rights to like everything Star Trek because they show OG Star Trek. They show Star Trek TNG. They showed Voyager. Deep Space Nine, what, 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 I mean, everything, everything. So it may be just a matter of time before they show the animated series once again. Maybe. Potentially, but, you never know. Yeah, but if you want to have the music to Star Trek the Animated Series, a collection of that can be found in the Star Trek 50th Anniversary four CD collection from La La Land Records and a selection of tracks are available on disc two. It's about uh, 43 tracks, but something that me and Chico, uh, we were doing some show prep before uh, you got on, Mike, and we were listening to a section from the Inglorious Trexperts podcast regarding the production of this CD for the Star Trek The Animated okay. Series music. So, All right. like, the original cues for the animated series, like, don't exist. Like, at all. Like, all the all the takes, all the recordings, they don't exist. But the tracks survive on, like, something that's called a DME, which is, like, one layer has dialogue, one layer has the music, and one layer has the sound effects. So... 
you separate um, the tracks and then you put them all together into one like mono track. So they separated like the music, but the thing is the music like goes like up and down because of obviously you get to have the dialogue and you don't want to have the music going over the dialogue and all. So they went through like a complicated process of trying to put the um the music together where it could be like listenable for CD purposes and try to like master it. So basically all the tracks on the CD are about as good as it can possibly get given the limitations. So okay, good. So now that we talked about everything that this show has left us, we are left with the one big question. Is the Star Trek animated series canon? The answer to that, well, it's complicated. Yeah, Gene Roddenberry does not consider this canon. Yeah, and he went on record at the end of the first season of TNG as saying so. In fact, writers of the novels, comics, and RPGs were prohibited from using concepts from the animated series in their works. And apparently, Robert April was not recognized officially as the first captain of the Enterprise until at least... um, Like Discovery, because I mentioned he's mentioned on Strange New Worlds. Yeah. And uh, Michael Okuda and Denise Okuda, who are production staffers from TNG who established the uh, Okuda timeline, they do include uh, certain events from yesteryear and acknowledge Robert April as the first captain of the Enterprise. In their 1999 update to the Star Trek Encyclopedia, they say... In a related vein, this work, i.e. book, adheres to Paramount Studio policy that regards the animated Star Trek series as not being part of the official Star Trek universe, even though we count ourselves among that series' fans. Of course, the final decision as to the authenticity of the animated episodes, as with all elements of the show, must clearly be the choice of each individual reader. So it depends on what is candid or not to the viewer. Yeah, but David Gerald and DC Fontana, who are instrumental in the animated series, do have their bit to say. David Gerald went on record as saying, Arguments about canon are silly. I always felt that Star Trek Animated was part of Star Trek because Gene Roddenberry accepted the paycheck for it and put his name on the credits. (laughs) This is true. Yes? This is true. And DC Fontana and all the other writers involved busted their butts to make it the best Star Trek they could. But this whole business of canon really originated with Gene's Aaron Boy. Oh, God. Oh, my God. (laughs) Gene liked giving people titles instead of raises. So the Aaron Boy got named Archivist, and apparently it went to his head. (laughs) Gene handled him the responsibility of answering all fan questions, silly or otherwise, and he apparently let that go to his head. DC Fontana stated in 2007, I suppose canon means what Gene Roddenberry decided it was. Remember, we were making it up as we went along on the original series and the animated one, too. We had a research company to keep us on the straight and narrow as to science, projected science based on known science, Science fiction references, we didn't want to step on anyone else's exclusive ideas in movies or other works. They also helped prevent contradictions and common reference errors. So the so-called canon evolved in its own way in its own time. For whatever reason, Gene Roddenberry apparently didn't take the animated series seriously, no pun intended, although we worked very hard to do the original Star Trek stories and concepts at all times in the animated series. On June 27, 2007, Star Trek's official website incorporated information from the animated series into the library section 
with many pointing to this as evidence that the animated series is canon, though this has not been officially confirmed nor denied. Both Gerald and Fontana have stated that the animated series is essentially the fourth season that fans wanted originally. In addition, the 2009 film Star Trek references yesteryear. The Discovery episode Context is for Kings has Spock's foster sister, Michael Burnham, state that their mother, Amanda read Alice in Wonderland to them as children, as in the episode Once Upon a Planet. A season two episode of Lower Decks features a giant Spock skull head, and a race introduced in the Jihad is named the Nasat in ebook novellas involving the Starfleet Corps of Engineers. So to answer the million dollar question, is Star Trek the Animated Series canon? You know what? Y'all be the judge. Yeah. I'm not I, you know, I'm not taking that bait. Sorry. No. But you know what, guys? In the mid 70s when we didn't have Star Trek for at least 10 years, this filled the gap. And you know what? It became a thing on TV. A very amazing thing on TV. Yes. That was probably done with the animation budget of like a hundred dollars. I hope the animation got better as the time went on because that first animation was horrible. Yeah. It was very bad. Well, that's gonna do it for this episode. And of course, you can always go to our website, it was a thing on TV dot com where you can listen to the 302 episodes that preceded this. And you can also find all sorts of bonus stuff like live shows and mini-sodes and all sorts of other great goodies. And, of course, we are on YouTube. And when you're on YouTube, you can like and subscribe. And don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date on all future episodes including oh guys on Thursday we mentioned this the NFL season is going to get underway in Los Angeles as the Rams defend their Super Bowl title or if you're listening to this on Place to Be Nation it's already happened sorry about that we're recording this on September 2nd folks yeah so if you're listening on the Place to Be Nation congratulations Whoever. Congratulations, Matthew Stafford, on throwing 300 yards. <laughs> but yeah, uh, to celebrate the beginning of the NFL football, we have a show. Somebody at a network that doesn't exist anymore thought that giving these two players perhaps the most outspoken players on the Cincinnati Bengals, a TV show where they talk about sports and other miscellaneous. Was it as bad as everyone thought it was? We'll find out next time right here on It Was a Thing on TV. For Lieutenant Commander Klaus, for Commander Diener, I'm Captain Chico. Live long and prosper. Wow! Someday I'll learn. Aye, Captain. But you've got to admit, if we've got to have tribbles, it's best if all our tribbles are little ones. <laughs>